We're absolutely honoured this evening to have Professor John Sulston, who's right at the, uh, on my right just there. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society and biologist. He won the 2002 Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine. I'm instructed by him to say categorically that his Nobel Prize is absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the genome, uh, which I hope is... Uh, 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 but on the other hand, I can't pronounce uh, what it is about, and so I, I can't give you more information than I've just given you. But he's really is one of the most distinguished scientists in this country. Um, he played a central role. Uh, he was made director of the Sanger Centre um, and uh, now called the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute and has worked immensely hard on the process of looking at the genome and seeing how that develops in various ways. So it's absolutely fundamental uh, to the way in which we consider life in various ways. Um, he's now a leading campaigner, amongst other things, against the patenting of human genetic information. And as far as his faith is concerned, he's a very distinguished supporter of the British Humanist Association. And in 2003, 2003 was one of 21 Nobel laureates who signed the Humanist Manifesto, and that's been, a, I think, a driving part of his life. We're very fortunate that Andrew Brown, in the middle here, has agreed to interview John. Um, Andrew is a journalist and writer. You, I'm sure many of you will have read what he's written in The Guardian and previously sometimes uh, in The Independent. He's written a number of books, uh, including ones very significantly about the relationship between science uh, and religion. And he uh, tried in his book, The Darwin, Darwin Wars, to explore the significance of evolutionary theory on attempts to understand the human condition, including areas which were once exclusively the domain of religion. He's an ideal person to explore these questions uh, with John. One of the things that to me is most striking about your character is that the very short distance between what you think you ought to do and you're actually doing it. Um, most people have their ideals up here and their actions over here somewhere. With you they're much more like this. And uh, this tends to be something that religious people think of as their own private domain, but you're not. Um, your father, though, was an army chaplain. So why did you reject his beliefs? Yes, it's a, it's a hard word, but it's the correct word to say reject. It was the tough thing that I had to do during my late teens, was to actually bring out into the open. It was a, it's a coming out, you know. It was, really was a coming out. Um, and the extraordinary thing was when I got to Cambridge, having sort of got through that, um, or you know, having made the decision, but still uneasy about it, uh, I, and we were talking, you know, late into the night about everything we, we as students do. When I told people about this, they said, and? So what? Because they hadn't had that experience. So you're quite right. It was this very special thing. I mean, I think everybody has to break from their parents in one way or another. And that was the most crucial thing that I had to do. Why? Well, that, I think, is one of the things we need to discuss at greater length. Um, you know, I can list perhaps the, the sorts of reasons. Is that what you would oh, like yes, me to do please. at this stage already? Dive in. Yes, OK. This, these are small points compared with the big ones. But as far as I was concerned, I tried very hard. I really did. I, I was encouraged. I was uh, part of the, ch the Anglican Church, this is. My father would celebrate. Um, communion on, on Sundays. He, he, uh, I became a server at the altar and I participated in the youth club and, and so on and so on. Um, and then I began to question, I began to ask, I said, for, I suppose one of the earliest things really, and perhaps the, the easy essential one, is to say, why this religion? Why are we Anglicans rather than Catholics or Methodists? Why indeed are we Christians? What about these other people who have other faiths, other gods? And the more I learned, of course, the, the more I realized that there was something different here and one could not have faith. And this, I think, is quite central to the thing you're discussing here. You use the word faith, uh, and each of you means something different by it, I think. And I realized that I could not choose. If I really step back from what my father had was saying and living, I couldn't choose. I couldn't say, yes, I have faith in that. Not anymore. 
even though I tried very hard and had experienced it in a certain way, uh, the, the sense of Good Friday, for example, keeping vigil on Good Friday. I immersed myself in that. And then I had to come out of it and say, I'm sorry, there's other people who have other views about this day and they're just as valid. So I think we can go on to other points, but that's the central one. And for me, at the time, but I think the other one, which we, I may as well introduce, and this does need a longer discussion, is coming to the realisation that you did not have to have faith to be, as you might say, good or moral or something like that. I began to realise that it was not necessary. Had that been an assumption at your child? Well, I think it does come together, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, people um, in a parish tend to think of themselves as as being Christian. We use the word Christian, you know, the Christian act and so on. Actually, they're, they're not talking about Christianity t at all. They're talking about the golden rule. And I would love to come on and we should discuss this more about where things come from. They're really talking about the golden rule. And no, nobody, not, not Christians, uh, not, not Hindus, not humanists, nobody can appropriate the golden rule to their own particular lifestyle. It's something that we all share. And I realise that... Uh, Therefore, that the, the Christianity was not essential for that. And again, it, it meant there wasn't the sort of need to hang on for, the, for, for that particular reason. Religion seemed to me to provide reasons, if not logical ones, reasons of feeding, reasons of belonging for, for subscribing to the Golden Rule. What do you do without them? It's very important. Um, and I think we need to go back. We really do need to step back, as I did, as a teenager, but step back further and step back in time and ask where did religions come from? And it seems to me that far and away the best explanation we have of religion is that we are social animals and we are pack animals. It is our nature to be pro-social and it's our nature to look for strong leaders of one kind or another. Religion, any religion, supplies both of these requirements. But why were we selected for this pro-social behavior, which is the golden rule, is a very convenient shorthand for, is pro-social behavior? Well, because of that, we are evolved in a way where anybody who stepped outside that for any length of time would perish. Somebody who leaves the society cannot exist on their own. We are social animals. I see religion as being the secondary thing and the golden rule, the pro-social behavior, as being the primary thing. Now, this is the question I want to ask you and I, I really want us to explore because I think it's enormously important. We're at a very critical time, as you indicate, in human history. Is religion helpful? If so, which religion? Is it all religions? Because clearly we have quite a lot. Look at America right now. <laughs> We do not see religion in any way as bringing people together into a more social way. I would think we are more social here in a secular way than America is in a Christian way. Um, but I just picked that one example. We, we cannot argue this on anecdotes. It's just to illustrate the way, the way I'm thinking about it. It's not obvious to me that we do want to go uh, further into religion, uh, but rather recognize where religion comes from and recognize the crucial importance of, of social behavior in the future, cooperative behavior. As you indicate, we've got to go more towards the golden rule, less greed. We've got to share the resources of the earth or we shall all perish. It seems to me that the, the problem of enlarging the, the sphere of sympathy is, despite everything, a religious one, simply because reason doesn't get us far enough. I would think it's exactly the opposite, Andrew. I really would, because when you look at what's going on with religion... I mean, I used to agree with you. But <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> By the end of the evening, you'll be agreeing with me again. <laughs> um, but, but really, when you look objectively, just step back and look objectively at the divisions between nations. Yes. Are they more often... Uh, um, helped or, or I mean are they more often increased or decreased by religion I mean for heaven's sake we had the last American president who went around saying it was a it was a war between between Christianity and Islam 
Well, actually, he didn't. He, was, he wanted to say it, but he was very <laughs> careful yes. not to. But, you know, that was the sentiment, wasn't it? And, of course, you know, there are people who feel that way, you know, and, and I, I think that it's not obvious that religion will help us. We do not need religion, I would, I would submit, to bind us together in nation states. And so the big question is how we go beyond the nation state and how we get international cooperation. And I see secular activities as doing that at least as well as religion, though I see no objection to using religion if it's helpful. But which particular secular activities? I mean, before the First World War, there was this lovely theory that we were also interlocked with trade and with the clear benefits of peace, that we could never go to war. A very clever man called Norman Angel wrote a book to that effect. And in limited areas, it works very well. Free trade areas and the Euro Europe is one. Well, you know, Europe hasn't started World War Three. Well, not yet. Yeah, and, but that uh, is, <laughs> it's not just because of free trade. It's also it's because, because of our quite sobering trade. experiences of the first two Well, it is actually, trade. though, I think the common market was pretty <laughs> Pretty important, don't you? Yeah. I mean, the you know the the, the tra trading is a really good thing to do, and for that reason, although as you indicated uh, in the introduction about my feeling about patenting genes or whatever, which is somewhat bound up with some of these issues, um, I, I welcome that 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 that, uh, that people are going in and investing in China, for example. I think it's extremely valuable in terms of world peace. We do have to translate that into something more, which is, which is dealing with limited resources. But if we can do that, then it's, it's not a bad basis. So I'm afraid I would say, yes, that's far more useful than, than having the same religion, is, is having the, um, the, same, um, the same trading uh, arrangements. Now, what I'm saying, and the reason for the rather lengthy introduction about the golden rule and our prehistory, is that that's what came first. And people have added in the higher power, very often for their own ends. I mean, after all, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, the, 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 the religious powers got filthy rich out of right. running their churches. So they had a very good reason for promoting religion, but that was not what was, was, was there in the first place. So all I'm doing is to say, I am a follower of the golden rule, but I'm not a theist. It's as simple as that. Very importantly, I think, and I'm repeating myself a little bit, but, but elaborating, we are at a, at, a, at a crux in terms of evolution. What brought us here to this point is not what's going to carry us on beyond. That's why these issues are so important. That's why we're here tonight. And religion is just the first step of articulating, if you like. I personally am guessing that we shall shed all this God stuff this religion stuff. Um, Andrew's not terribly keen on, on the humanist and uh, philosophy and admittedly, well, no, but it's, it's fair enough. I mean, it's, and I certainly uh, over, am not... Over what time scale will we shed it in your view? Well, I think in some respects we need to shed it quite fast. Yeah, how long have we got? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, if it does result in, in increased conflict, then we need to at least dampen it down a lot and so that it becomes more of a hobby. Uh, and, and less of a, of a sort of driving force. But I just do not see that as being the important thing. And, and what constitutes human flourishing is that, is that we go on successfully. The, the reason, and I, I will just for the moment stick to the more traditional version, uh, point about religion, because that mm. really does make yeah. the distinction that I want. This, this higher unseen power entitled to obedience, reverence and worship, the difficulty with that is that it removes responsibility from us. And that's what we cannot afford, especially at this point in history. We don't have more space and more resources. We are in conflict with each other over all sorts of stupid things, which we don't need to be. We are not short of food or water or anything else. What we are short of is, the, is proper distribution right now. And we shouldn't be because we ourselves, and this is the, the, really the crucial thing about, our, about, about what we've got here, are transcendent thinkers. Not transcendental, transcendent. Think outside the box in management speak. As far as we know, um, there's no other species that really does this to any extent, although very interestingly, we can, we can trace the continuity. It's not that we suddenly got insulated at some point and, and were magical, different, different divine beings. No, 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 no. It comes out of the birds and the, and the other primates and so on. You can see them. But we do it in a way which is so much better that we do it across time, across space, across generations. We are transcendent thinkings. We know what we're doing. We know what's happening. What's missing, and, and I do not know whether, whether 
theist religions or un-atheist religions or whatever you may call it, maybe according to your definition it's sufficiently broad that of course, yes, it's going to be religion, but I just don't think it helps to, to okay. sort of say everything is a religion. But in some way or another we have to to reflect that transcendent thinking that everybody's capable of back into more responsible collective behavior. And believing in an unseen higher power is not going to help that because it allows you to escape. And you end up with the, with the, with the, the old thing about people you know, making loads of money, cheating other people during the week and going to church on Sunday if you're not very careful. I hope I didn't come across in my, in my factual account of my own story that I can disprove the existence of God. Of course I would not say that. Um, I, I do, do, however, stick to the point of it, the explanations I've tried to give that I, along with many other people, have realized that, that belief in a higher power was, was no longer necessary in the light of some of these, these explanations. Um, but I would stick, to, however, to the point I made about responsibility. I think there's a great danger in the belief in the higher power if it allows you to absolve it to any degree whatever uh, res responsibility and that I think we should continue to pursue. What's the, and, difference, uh, what's the difference John between a, what's the difference between a higher power meaning some theistic or godlike figure and a scientific theory can't people similarly abstract themselves from responsibility by saying science explains that. It's, it's the, this is what's wrong with the word faith. Faith means you're supposed to go on believing this higher power regardless. Mm. Whereas the whole point about science, and that's where we had the this, this difficulty, Bernard, wasn't it? Is that people are perfectly right to say that um, there is no such thing as a scientific fact. What we were saying about evolution is this is a fact just as good as the law of gravity or whatever. Right. And, and this is, the yeah. So. And it's important because people are misusing this, this point about evolution, right, to say creationism is just as good and everything's relative. Right? So that was our point. Um, and so, so that's the whole essence of science, and that's its power, and that's, that's why I so confidently say that we've got a huge future ahead of us, is if we go on exploring in this uh, thoughtful and objective and, and questioning way, then we're going to find out a huge amount more than we, we do at the moment. And, and whether we should tell kids stories about it, well, fine, no, it's, stories are absolutely great, but it just so long as you don't attach dogma to any particular aspect of these stories. Ruth Scott, um, Anglican priest. Um, I've just been thinking that as you're talking, it seems to me that you're talking as though the relig religious language and scientific language are the same type of languages, and that religious language has become obsolete because it's been replaced by scientific process. Um, and it seems to me that they're two different types of language, that, that religious language is more the language of the arts than the language of science, and that they are addressing different issues. And I don't see that reflected in what you're saying, and I wonder if you could comment on that. I'm afraid I do have to disagree with you with great respect, that I, although superficially these are different types of language, I don't think they're addressing different issues. Um, I mean, certainly if you take one little bit of science, then you can say, well, that's just addressing a fruit fly's legs or something, what's it to me? But as soon as you get into larger things, and I've been projected, and this is where the genome background I have has been very important, I sort of, through that, got projected into the involvement of science in society and what did it mean for people and, and also how we handle the data, all sorts of things. I felt that actually these, these are the big issues that... Um, religious narrative and scientific narrative are both addressing these in the end, although they may have their own mechanisms on the way. And so I don't think we should separate them out. The, the fact that John is able to come here and say all these things without um, as far as he can tell any reference to anything that he would recognize as religion, because I do see that my definition is, is itself a significant and interesting thing about our society, which is worth thinking about, because I think it's, to the, most people, um, whether religious or not, are not theologians, they're lousy at theology, and the worst way to understand people's beliefs is by asking them to codify them. 
um, they're, they're not um, coherent that way. So the, the sort of official philosophy of humanism seems to me um, pretty much nonsense. Um, I, you know, I'll take, I'll take the sort of atheist bit, but the fact that British Humanist Association wants to go and be represented at the Cenotaph, well, that says to me, this is another religious grouping. You know, you're not getting beyond religion, you're replacing it with a possibly slightly better variation. Um, but the fact that somebody can actually live such a, a useful and admirable life as John does, while discarding Christianity. Now that's interesting. That's interesting in the same way as Charles was interested in the fact that there are useful and valuable evangelical Christians whose beliefs put as theology are ludicrous. As to, to sum up the whole discussion, I'm just really glad that John came here and spoke so freely and forcefully because the purpose of these these interviews is not really to have a debate, but to bring out different ways in which people think about the things which have been traditionally questions that religion solved. And I don't think we could have had a, a better, clearer, or more persuasive thinker from his <laughs> corner than John. And thank you very much. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, so, um, Science revealing moral truths. I mean, I think sci what science does is to set the stage and to open up uh, vistas for us to think about. The human genome is a very good example of that, where you, we, kn we know now the basic set of instructions to make us. We still don't know very much about how it all works, and we, 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 but, but, but all it does is to, is to make a baby, and then the baby learns and so on. So, so Moral truths are, are a product of our nature and our nurture and our experiences and our social experiences. And it really comes back to the beginning about, about, the, you know, about how we have to have these m basic moral truths in order to survive. And the, but the thing is, we should also celebrate them because this gives us power. You know, I mean, what's holding us back is, is the individualist kicking against any constraints on them. And that's coming back to, you know, why, why, why do people get filthy rich and, and, and cause trouble and all the rest of it. So, so you know, if we can see it. And so now the, the question then, this is not about special people who are transcendent thinkers. The point is, this is us. We are transcendent thinkers.